Sarah Bowdoin from Horse Racing Nation, joined by Keeneland Morning Line Maker, as well as track announcer at Sam Houston Race Park, Nick Tamaro. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk some Breeders' Cup with me, and we've got a tough one in the Breeders' Cup turf. Thanks for having me, Sarah. Looking forward to uh, chatting with you, and obviously to the Breeders' Cup in general. I think the turf, definitely one of the more interesting races on what should be a pretty amazing couple of days of racing. And you've taken over the morning line duties at Keeneland. This is not your first time making a morning line. However, do you feel as though Keeneland has its own difficulties and challenges and um, sort of has anything come up for you as uh, something you've been surprised by while doing this so far? Um, I mean, I'm surprised by how many people get mad about bad morning lines. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, all kidding aside, um, yeah, it's really tough, right? It's it, Keeneland is probably it's sort of its own thing um, with with only Saratoga comparable. Delmar's getting there too, I think, with the the influx of horses from elsewhere. But you're trying to put together how horses are going to be bet that are coming from so many different places. Right. And that's the difficulty is that, you know, I had claiming races where I was dealing with horses from Belterra and uh, Thistledown and Churchill and Ellis and Saratoga and Mammoth, you know, all at the same time. And that's tough. You know, it's tough to figure out. You're trying to use speed figures as a gauge. But, you know, I do think the public is probably easing up a little bit on how much importance they put on buyer speed figures. So you're trying to just you know, do this difficult task often 72 hours in advance and predicting how the public is going to bet. So it was, it was very tricky. Uh, some of the races that some people might think are a little bit harder really weren't. Some of the two-year-old races are bet in a very, I guess you could call it uh, easily predictable way. The big pedigrees, the big barns, they get bet a lot. You know, it's just luckily most of the time it ends up that simple. And, uh, you know, I don't want this job at all. Um, so anybody that takes on the the task of coming up with the morning lines and trying to predict how the betting public is going to approach a race and each one is going to be its own different challenge. I think that even when you don't get it totally correct, you learn something from it. And I know that you're a person that always at least does the homework into it and is uh, at least putting some work and effort into trying to figure out how these races are going to go. So um, I think that you're doing a great job so far and Keelan's a tough meet. I appreciate it. Yeah. I mean, if, if I made a mistake, it was not for not trying or not putting the work in. Um, you know, there were days where I knew going in, you know, I probably could have done that a little differently. And, and there were some races definitely that I ended up looking very foolish, which is going to happen. You know, it's uh, it's a short meet, but it's five days a week. So, I mean, the, the work really never stops. You're more or less working on it six, seven days a week trying to stay ahead of the curve. And, you know, when a Saturday card gets drawn and it's 10 super competitive races with big fields, that line's due at 8 a.m. Eastern the next day. So, I mean, there is a narrow window for you to to really do all of your, your necessary work to be prepared and, and have the line ready and hopefully decent. Exactly. And for all of the complaints, I, I guarantee that um, many of them would not do quite the job that you do in coming up with these lines. So I'm glad that you take it all in stride and at least know that you put in the effort and the time and energy for it. And in this race that we're going to be talking about, the Breeders' Cup turf, we're going a mile and a half. So it is that turf marathon and it's the last race before the classic. And you've um, kind of gotten it down to Rebels Romance and Nation's Pride as far as, far as the, uh, the, the favorites in this spot um what sort of went into making the line for this race so one of the things that i uh used as a bit of a guide at least in terms of how to handle the international participants was to go to oddschecker.com and just see kind of how the anti-post market was looking overseas and and that that really helped me more to see just how low to go on certain horses which ones were really more fancy than others so um you know for example silver nod on friday in the juvenile turf i made three to one uh odds checker has them around three to two so i don't know if the the wagering public in america is sort of funny unless you're a really high profile horse so unless we were talking about maybe like a bayid or, or adiar or somebody like that I don't know if we're, we're getting anybody this entire weekend that's got that kind of profile. So I think that we'll have horses that are, that are pretty well backed. But um, to answer your question more specifically, Charlie Appleby is going to be a big driver to the market. I think that, uh, that, that people are going to play his horses a little more heavily than they would have otherwise, just with the success he's had in America over the last couple of years. So all of his horses got, you know, the, the, the Chad Brown treatment. 
in a way they all got uh, the Chad Brown, Todd Pletcher, Bob Baffert treatment. They all got marked down a little bit. And um, with Rebels, Romance, and Nation's Pride, the, the main decision I had to make was who to make the favorite of the two. And, and I ended up choosing Rebels, Romance only because his four straight wins on turf, um, multiple of which have been at the distance, I thought would probably be a little bit more compelling to the betting public even though they're more familiar with Nation's Pride. See, Nation's Pride's domestic races are not really that much better than Warlike Goddess's best races. But I do think that his blowout margin last time, the fact that he did it uh, that he did it recently, is really going to earn a lot of credibility for, for the wagering public. So I, I gave Rebels Romance a slight nod. I actually moved Nation's Pride's price down to 4-1 to one once... Uh, uh, William Buick opted to go. I'm sorry, I moved it from four to one to seven to two. Once William Buick opted to ride Nation's Pride, because I think the public will factor that in a little bit. James Doyle does have a Group One win on Rebels Romance prior, though. And I think uh, something that you bring up is just people betting names and connections. And, you know, you're going to see certain uh, stars of the Breeders' Cup or certain people that you're familiar with. And those are the, the ones that are going to take some money. And it, it might not matter to some people who the horse is. It might just be the name. And one of those names is Irad Ortiz Jr., who is riding Broom, um, and this is a horse that he has been on once before in the States, and that was the second last year in this race, the Breeders' Cup Turf to Yabir. With this horse, we've kind of, I think, seen the best from him, and I don't I don't know that he has a shot in a race like this, but I thought that was a little bit of an interesting move that Irad picks up the mount again on this one. Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to earn him some support, and that's part of the reason why I, I moved him down to 12-1. to 1, um, He's still an outsider. He was kind of favored by default in, in the uh, Sword Dancer, mainly because I think the, the a lot of the betters over here have sort of rejected our horses in this division summarily, um, rightfully so, because it's been, it's been a rough few years. Um, but so, you know, if he lost a horse like Gufo, who didn't take a nickel and got buried by Warlike Goddess, you feel like Broom's still a little bit more of an outsider, I don't think he ran poorly in the arc, uh, which was run over bottomless ground. I mean, it was extremely soft. Broom is probably a horse that is going to prefer a firmer course, hence why he ran well at Del Mar. And, um, and so I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up getting a pretty big piece of it. I would just have a hard time betting him at, at any, any less than his morning line price. I agree with you there. And I don't know that he is necessarily in the absolute best form that he has been maybe going into this race last year. Although, I mean, nothing to scoff at as far as what he's done this year. Um, Warlike Goddess, uh, taking on the boys yet again. I think that we saw last time they made the choice to do so in the Joe Hirsch Turf Classic to see if she could handle males. I think because Bill Mott wants this distance for her because she has had so much success at this mile and a half distance. She is now a perfect five for five at the mile and a half on the grass. And I mean, any doubts I think that we had about her ability to take on males, she kind of proved them wrong last time in the Joe Hirsch. Although obviously this is a much tougher field with those Euros invading as well. Yeah. I mean, I think if this Breeders' Cup was being contested at Churchill, she probably wouldn't be in the turf. But the fact that it's at Keeneland and that the Philly and Mare turf is a mile and three sixteenths, which I think Warlike Goddess has made abundantly clear is too short for her. Um, I, I think that's why she's here. And I think it works out that she's really in the best form of her career. And, and at this stage of the game as a five-year-old, she's deserving of the opportunity against males um, at, at what is her best distance over a course where she's two for two. It just all seems to make sense at this point. And, you know, aside from a, a questionable ride that led to a defeat in the flower bowl. She's been largely perfect over the last two years. I mean, her two defeats were, were races where she was best both times. So, I mean, she's been very, very good and it's admirable that, uh, that Bill Mott has held her together for this long. So I'm excited to see how she stacks up with uh, a little bit better competition than what she met at, at Aqueduct last time out. But nonetheless, I mean, she's uh, she's a deserving, I would say third choice. I agree with you. And I think, you know, you kind of hate to say that Joel Rosario getting back aboard is a negative, but um, I think <laughs> questionable is a kind word for the ride that we saw in um, her race where Virginia Joy had a pace edge on her and was able to pull out the win. Obviously, that's not exactly her best distance in that flower bowl, but 
I mean, Jose Lascano wrote her very well last time. And even before that, Julian LaBrue had some success with her. It it makes me a little nervous, Joelle, getting back on in a big race like this with her drawing towards the inside, breaking from post two. I I know that he's obviously a very capable jockey, um, and I'm not trying to discredit him in any way, but there have been a couple of rides of his, not only on her, but on other horses throughout the summer that were perhaps a little overconfident. Yeah, I, and that was really what killed him in the Flower Bowl. The, the thing that really kind of irked me about that ride was that she had been much handier in her prior two starts in 2022. And so it was like, you know, don't turn her into some pokey plotting one run closer by dragging her all the way out of it. And, and then, and the other thing that Leperu did really well with her that Joel has been a little more hesitant to do is, you know, I think Julian's approach in a number of races was the hell with it. I'm going wide. You know, I'd rather keep her in the clear, especially once she hits her stride, than take this, you know, obviously very, very strong kicking, um, uh, well-built horse and try and weave my way between horses. It's just a recipe for disaster. And so I, I thought that's what kind of bothered me about Joel's ride as much as anything. The other thing was that I think he took the competition a little lightly in the Flower Bowl, which on paper, there was nothing wrong with doing that. The thing is, Virginia Joy is not a bad horse, and you give her such an enormous tactical advantage, and obviously her chances improve. So I, I'm glad that uh, Lescano was far more aggressive with her in terms of where he positioned her. Now, yes, she was farther off the pace last time out than even when she was in the Flower Bowl. But they were going a lot faster. And so she's always going to be a, a mare that's in a better spot in a race where they're moving a little bit. So I, I think that the, the likely pace scenario in here kind of mitigates any concern about where he might put her. Obviously, if she's 12th early, that's not good, you know, or they're flying, which I don't think they're going to fly. And I don't think he's going to drag her back quite that much. The edge in here for her is that to me, if you're trying to draw up a scenario, you're trying to chase Nation's Pride and you want to move right after Nation's Pride because more than likely you're going to be moving before Rebels Romance if you're in that scenario. Rebels Romance is a little bit more of a of a one-run closing type. So I think if they could work things out on paper, that's kind of how they do it. And speaking of moving early, we do have Bye Bye Melvin right to her inside, who he's a half to mean Mary, who is a very accomplished um, older female on the this uh these marathon turf distances and he stretched all the way out for the first time last time in the joe hirsch and he drew the rail in there as well he went to the front early and i don't think he went that slowly early for the distance and i mean finishing second to warlike goddess it's not as though he was finishing ahead of too much since gufo didn't really fire his best shot in that spot but I think that this distance certainly suits him. And you also have a uh, grand motion bookending this field with the 13 horse Highland chief as well, who is one that I didn't really take seriously last time. And I ended up regretting it. Yeah. Bye bye. Melvin's actually run well in all three of his 2022 starts. And uh, Graham gave him that class test last time. I think when push comes to shove, he was helped by the rail coming down on the inner turf at Aqueduct that weekend. And it, it, inside placed horses did run very well, pretty much all weekend. So I think he got helped along a little bit by that. But nonetheless, I don't want to shortchange him. I think he's a horse that uh, that is obviously getting better. The distance really seems like no obstacle. Look, I mean, you could do worse than to take him at 20 or 25 to 1 as far as the two days of racing goes. Um, he's just going to need a he's going to need a break at some point along the way. And he never got one last time. So in order to beat these horses, I, I do think that would have to occur. Um, I bet Highland Chief last time, so I got the money. I'm out as far as it go, he goes this summer. And he had an unbelievable trip and a great ride from John Velasquez. Admittedly, uh, Graham Motion said he's a horse that's better in cooler temperatures. It's kind of funny. It's going to be almost 80 degrees on Saturday at Keeneland as of right now. I don't know how much that would hurt him. I think he likes less than firm turf as well. And uh, this Keeneland course can end up getting a little spongy in the fall. So um, I don't, I, I don't, I wouldn't bet Highland Chief, but I wouldn't really argue with anybody that thinks, you know, hey, this is a horse who's run fast enough speed figure wise now multiple times, including once on this course just a few weeks ago. So why not take a shot at uh, at that same fifteen or twenty to one? Does post thirteen bother you at all for him, or and not so much? 
it bothers me because last time he got a perfect inside, uh, you know, covered up trip. So in all likelihood, he's not getting that. Um, he has enough tactical speed to position himself somewhat forwardly, but I think it stands to reason he's going to have to be used out of the gate. I mean, he's going to have to get squeezed a little by uh, by Johnny Velasquez to get a forward position. Otherwise, you just risk getting into that turn so hopelessly wide. So, it, it, you know, if you were looking to bet him, you probably wanted 10 and in. So 13 is not ideal, but you knew kind of what you were getting yourself into liking him. You knew you're taking a horse that really does have to elevate his game. Might as well pile on all the challenges. <laughs> I like it. Well, I'm glad that you had him last time. I had Temple for the pick four. And when he, yeah, I had a couple others too. It wasn't just him. But when he finished second at that huge price, I was like, come on. Um, he's the but exact. he's the exact. I didn't use Temple. So I, I needed, I bet Highland Chief to win and miss the exact. I think I had the the two Chad horses, one of which had a tough trip. I had a nice exact mm-hmm. with the highest honors. So yeah. <laughs> tough beats. Tough beats, um, but hopefully not for the Breeders' Cup. Um, one horse that I don't have any interest in betting in, but I feel like we at least need to talk about is Channel Maker, who's going to be making his 49th career start in here, which is just wild. I was watching some Breeders' Cup replays the other day, and I went all the way back to 2016, and I was watching the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf, and Oscar Performance won that race, and he was in there. Um, so he was running as a two-year-old all the way back then, and now Oscar Performance has two-year-olds that are running in the juvenile turf now and a channel maker is still out there kicking and I mean for anybody that's saying he's lost a step he's he's won twice this year I mean I don't think he's in quite the same best form that we've seen from him but he's he won the grade two Elkhorn here at Keeneland to start off this season Uh, he won another race this year at Belmont at this mile and a half Um, he does have early speed I, I don't think that he gets the lead away from uh, Bye Bye Melvin or possibly some others in this spot. And I, I don't think that he's a win candidate, but I just appreciate the longevity of his career and facing nothing but the absolute best competition this whole time. Yeah, I mean, he's a totally admirable horse, right? He's, he's danced a lot of dances and he's run well a number of times, including over this course a couple of years ago when he sewed up a division championship by finishing third. So hats off to him and the connections for for keeping him going. Um, It does look like his best days are behind him, but you know, there's a world in which bye bye Melvin goes and he sits just outside of him. He's been better with Saez when he's rated. So, um, you know, he's, is he impossible? No, he's very unlikely, but you know, I could see, I've certainly heard of betting, betting worse 50 to one shots. And I'll tell you, Sarah, there was a moment around the quarter pole in last year's Breeders' Cup turf where I, I said to myself, Holy cow, Channel Maker might win this race. The pace had been so taxing in that race that that ultimately it came apart pretty badly, but it's not without him running very well. I feel like he just always shows up and I just have so much respect for the consistency that we've seen from him from almost 50 career starts, which is just not something you see as much in racing nowadays. And with all this talk, we haven't even gotten to the Saudi Cup winner yet in number 11, Mishrif, who is uh, six to one on your morning line, who's putting the blinkers on, getting Frankie DeTore and such a versatility from this horse to have success at on the dirt, on the turf. Um, he finished second to Bayi not that long ago. He hasn't won in a while, and I feel like he has that name recognition factor that will affect his price. I'm not really interested in him, but what a cool horse, too. Yeah, totally. They, just a really, really easy horse to like. Um, it, it seems like he's off form. I don't, I really went back and, and I watched the arc a couple of times. I don't know how much opportunity he really had. He was very far back. He was held up. Uh, I had mentioned before, it was kind of bottomless ground. It was very, very soft. It was always going to be tough for him to pick up and get a piece, but he just kind of ran in place. And so I, I think it's, you know, this might be an opportunity to get him on some firmer turf. Um, there's also not really anything out there for him right now. I imagine his career is going to be is roughly in its 11th hour. So they're probably figuring why not. These are connections that are very good and have had a lot of success in, in North America. So I would throw him out at your own risk, but there's no doubt that you're going to be taking the worst of it odds wise because this horse is going to be the price that he is based on races that happened quite a while ago. Exactly. And I agree with your assessment of him completely. I think just kind of off form from uh, from the best of what we've seen from him. Um, is there anyone else in this field that we haven't already talked about that you feel like deserves a mention? And then we'll get to your top pick. 
No, I think we covered all the the principles. I mean, I um, I know there'll be some love for Gold Phoenix. I, I heard, have heard a few people say that they thought he was really coming into his own out in California. It's been a long time since California-based horses were really relevant in this race. Um, so I, I think he's probably a little bit up against it. And Red Knight ran really well, too, back at Kentucky Downs. That felt like more of maybe a Kentucky Downs-induced effort. So I think we've touched on all the all the main players. Hopefully we'll, we've gotten something right. <laughs> that's the hope correct um do you have a top pick in this race i'm gonna reluctantly pick rebels romance i really don't have anybody that i'd love to to bet um i'm gonna use him and, and more like goddess as main horses i'll probably back up with nation's pride i just think nation's pride is going to be over bet based on some really cupcake trips against lesser horses so I'd, I'd like to take more of a critical approach there and i'm not overly concerned with william buick choosing him over uh, oh, Rebels Romance because, as I said before, James Doyle won a group one on this horse already, so no big deal there. So that I think that's going to be my wagering approach. From an intra-race perspective, really don't know how actively I'll get involved. If there was maybe a horse I could embrace a little bit more as like a, an underneath trifecta filler, I probably would try that. I could maybe see myself playing Rebels Romance over Warlike Goddess, and maybe a horse like Broom, and trying to, uh, to hit the trifecta on kind of a narrow ticket. I like it. I think I think you're covered with the, the two warlike goddess and rebels romance, the two that are thus far undefeated at this distance. And one yep. of them's putting the record on the line and uh, will walk away with uh, that the record untarnished and the other will will have their first defeat at the distance unless we have a dead heat, which who knows? It's happened before in the Breeders' Cup turf 19 years ago. <laughs> All right. Well, Nick, thank you so much for taking the time to talk about this Breeders' Cup turf with me. A tough race and a uh, great morning line so far from you. Looking forward to uh, more of your insight and uh, input as time goes on in racing in general. Thanks for having me, Sarah. I appreciate it. Anytime.